We're ready to do something a little different at a plenary event. It is a little bit of innovation. We've done dialogues and debates before, but I don't know that we've done one in a plenary, at least for a while. This is something that we've been talking about a lot and wanting to do more of. Uh, you'll see this nice semicircle arranged behind me or beside me in uh, William F. Buckley firing line style. There are people in this room old enough to know what that is. And our question is, what does Christianity have to offer the poor? And so I want to introduce everyone to you, and then um, Father Robert is going to launch us. There will be a time for them to dialogue with one another. And then when Father Robert's ready, I'll come back up and we'll take your questions. So same as we've done every night, use Slido, your browser or your app, put your questions in, vote for questions that you're most interested in, and then I'll come back up and, and read those. So first of all, Elizabeth Bruning is an assistant editor for the Washington Post Outlook section, and she writes on Christianity and politics. Prior to working at the Post, Elizabeth was a staff writer for the New Republic on religion and policy, and before that was working toward her PhD in religion and critical thought at Brown University. Elizabeth earned her Master's of Philosophy at the University of Cambridge, graduated summa cum laude from Brandeis University. And her writing has appeared in the Washington Post, The Nation, Jacobin Magazine, The American Conservative, The Atlantic, and many more. Michael Ware is the founder of Public Square Strategies, LLC, and a leading expert and strategist at the intersection of faith, politics, and American public life. As one of President Obama's ambassadors to America's believers, that's a BuzzFeed quote, Michael directed faith outreach for President Obama's 2012 re-election campaign and was also one of the youngest White House staffers in modern American history. He served in the White House faith-based initiative during President Obama's first term, where he led evangelical outreach and helped manage the White House's engagement on religious and values issues, including adoption and anti-human trafficking efforts. Dr. Ann Rathbone Bradley is the Vice President of Economic Initiatives at the Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics, where she develops and commissions research toward a systematic biblical theology of economic freedom. She's a visiting professor at Georgetown and a visiting scholar at the Bernard Center for, America, for Women, Politics, and Public Policy. She's an editor of and contributing author of If We, that's uh, Institute for Faith, Work, and Economics, recently released book for the least of these, A Biblical Answer to Poverty, and most recently, Counting the Cost, Christian Perspectives on Capitalism, where she specifically addresses the question of cap capitalism and how it affects the poor. Dr. Bradley is also a former analyst um, working with the CIA, examining the industrial organization of Al-Qaeda which I don't think she'll talk much about tonight, but um, and she'll have to kill us. She has yeah, right. a multifaceted <laughs> career. She earned her PhD in economics from George Mason University, and um, while she was there, she was a James M. Buchanan scholar. And last but not least, Reverend Robert A. Sirico received his Master of Divinity degree from Catholic University of America following undergraduate study at the University of Southern California and the University of London. During his studies in early ministry, he experienced a growing concern over the lack of training in religious, of, of religious study students that they receive in fundamental economic principles, having them poorly equipped to understand and address today's social problems. As a result of these concerns, Father Sirico co-founded the Acton Institute with Chris Marin in 1990. His writings on religious, political, economic, and social matters are published in a variety of journals, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Forbes, London Financial Times, Detroit News, and the National Review. He's appeared on ABC, BBC, NPR, CBS, 60 Minutes, and other programs. He is the author of Defending the Free Market. He's a member of the Mount Pelerin Society, the American Academy of Religion, and the Philadelphia Society. And he also served on the Michigan Civil Rights Commission from 94 to 98. His pastoral ministry has included a chaplaincy to AIDS patients at the National Institutes of Health. And he is, most importantly, pastor of Sacred Heart of Jesus Parish here in Grand Rapids. Father. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. We thought we would do something a little different tonight um, in terms of having this uh, discussion. It's not a formal debate, and yet in saying that, I don't want to uh, imply that we're going to uh, make believe that we agree on everything. Uh, there will be some things we will agree on, <clears throat> and I hope uh, lots that we won't agree on, uh, 
because I think the one of the sad things that that uh, I think is lacking in the public conversation <coughs> throughout our country, indeed around the world, is frank uh, discussion that really clashes. Uh, I have a few theories as to why that is the case, not the least of which is that there's been a denigration of the importance of philosophy and the search for truth, and what's replaced that is uh, a kind of psychological paradigm where emotion, how, think of how many times you hear a person say in the midst of an argument, I feel this way, I feel that way. Um, and when emotion or psychology becomes the mode of uh, debate, then all you can do to increase the force of your argument is not level a sharper point of reason, but just increase the volume or increase the emotion. There's too much of that. So in addition to the intellectual argumentation that we will engage in in a few moments here, I hope that what we uh, do is model the way in which people who have very um, firmly held beliefs uh, on critical issues can indeed clash, but clash civilly and clash reasonably and clash <laughs> intelligently. So in that sense, there is no safe space here tonight, not intellectually. Uh, um, can, I one ha thing can I have a few extra minutes just to cross out all the times I use feel in my remarks? So I just, <laughs> it would be helpful. That might, I don't know. I, we're just getting to know each other. It might not leave you with a lot to say. But do what you need to do. We'll find out. Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, it, the, the one thing um, that is indisputable uh, from my perspective is that at least from a Christian, certainly a Judeo-Christian point of view, but I'll speak as a Christian um, point of view, the question of human vulnerability, the question of poverty, is an indispensable part of the faith. Uh, it is not one item that you can uh, choose to engage in or not engage in, at least from a Christian point of view, the encounter with the poor, the love of the poor, is an indispensable part of our theology, of our Christology, because it is a, an encounter with Christ who, as St. Teresa of Calcutta said, comes to us in distressing disguise. Having said that, the indisputable part of it, the seems to me that the tradition leaves wide open, or if not fully wide open, open, the question of how to engage those questions. And I think that's going to occupy a lot of us here tonight, unless you introduce uh, you know, other arguments to be considered. But uh, I think largely what we're talking about here is questions of prudence, not questions of dogma. So the, the concession here, and perhaps the common agreement here, is that the poor form for us a basis for our encounter with the divine. So having said that, uh, let's begin uh, by asking where you kind of come out. I mean, e each of you, and, uh, and also in terms of the mode, I'm going to be involved in the discussion, but I'm also going to be moderating it. And uh, you tell me later on if I do a fair job at that, I, I hope. <laughs> the first speaker at an act and dinner uh, 27 years ago was, in fact, William F. Buckley. Mm. And how uh, I lament the fact that we have gone in a generation from the eloquence and the intelligence and the erudition of uh, a show like Firing Line to the regular food fight that you see on Hannity every night. Uh, this is uh, something to really be lamented. Um, so. Uh, I, I'll try and moderate and engage and prompt and, and bring out and, and uh, m my first set of questions uh, is designed for you to, to elicit from you. And so this will be a little more extended, give you a little more time and I won't interrupt the, the initial remarks, just to kind of get the stuff on the table here. Uh, and um, uh, Elizabeth, what, what's the matter with the way we think about poverty today? Christina, thank you so much for having me. It's my first time at Acton. It's been a wonderful experience so far. Thank you so much for your hospitality, and I really appreciate you having brought 
Michael is a friend out, and Anna, who just met, and, and have produced a panel of people who think long thoughts um, about things in a very different way, but crucial things. Um, so some of my background was in uh, Augustine. That's how I got into Christian theology. That's who I studied at Cambridge and at Brandeis, and I still write lots and lots about Augustine today. Um, and getting in through the patristics puts you in a certain mind about poverty because they had a very different economic landscape and they had a very different way of thinking about material creation than we do today. So in the patristics, you find a pretty interesting approach to property. <clears throat> and, and most of their discussion of poverty is very tightly woven in to their discussions of property as an idea. Um, so Augustine learns from Ambrose in Milan. Ambrose is very fierce on the storing up of property, uh, having very negative effects. That um, storing up large sums of property is, in effect, a usurpation from people who don't have as much because all of creation was given to mankind in common. Augustine picks up this thread um, and begins to, not in a systematic way, uh, but here and there, especially in homiletics, um, uh, try to figure out how civil law relates um, to what God intended for material creation. Augustine um, has this great letter where he says, look, civil law is very different than what God intended in terms of the distribution of creation. You would want someone who has been exploited through usury, I mean, totally destroyed by it, to be able to make recompense in court, but he can't do that. Uh, on the other hand, a very rich man who is or, uh, owed a small sum um, by a poor person can go make recompense in court. To Augustine, this is evidence that civil law is a prudential thing um, in terms of property uh, that is usually helpful um, but can at times fall extremely short of what God intended uh, in, in authorizing civil authorities to hold that kind of authority over people. Um, by the time you get to Aquinas inheriting Augustine, that's pretty much set. The theory becomes that private property is something that doesn't conflict with natural law and in fact uh, is a subset of natural law that is sort of allowable because it doesn't inherently conflict um, but can definitely be um, pretty broadly exploited. And I think that you know to really understand where uh, you, you get by Aquinas in terms of private property, it's helpful to understand that they had inherited um, from the patristics uh, a theory of property law that was pretty variegate compared to what we have now. Um, there were all kinds of ways you could approach the ownership of property, from usus to dominium to usufructus. There were lots of ways to encounter a thing that was owned um, that didn't give one absolute dominion over the thing. But it's really by the time we get to liberal property theorists like Locke um, that you see them moving away from this medieval tradition of property and from the patristic tradition. And they move to an intentionally secular theory of what property is, to an, an ontology of property. Um, that it is a thing with a metaphysical relationship to a person that can be absolutely owned, dominated, controlled, um, and that though you may have moral obligations or whatever to do different things with the property that you absolutely own, um, because of that metaphysical relationship, it becomes immoral um, and unallowable for a civil authority to intervene. So this is a big transformation in the way we think about um, property. And it, and it really gets going at the Reformation and then is fully realized um, in people like Locke and other liberal property theorists. Um, from, from these liberal property theorists, we uh, get where we are today in thinking about absolute ownership, absolute rights to property, a property right that uh, it suggests a metaphysical relationship between people and things that um, is inviolate in terms of civil authority and perhaps even separate from civil authority as to where you go back to Augustine and you see that private property uh, is an institution of civil government um, that doesn't necessarily but absolutely can um, conflict with what was intended by God for creation. So having said all that, just a little bit, um, <laughs> uh, I think that we've gotten to a place where we think about the poor um, as a kind of um, collateral damage margin that you can tweak up or down um, in, the, in the grand scheme of liberal property rights. Um, and I think that when you go back to Augustine and Ambrose, you see a very different approach. You see them as um, victims, if you want to use that terminology, that itself is anachronistic, but you certainly see them as people um, who have certain um, rights, or you can see people who have property as people who have certain duties, but poverty is the space where those rights and duties are not being met. Um, and, and that is kind of how I think of, of um, poverty. You know, another addendum that I would stick on really quickly um, is that I don't think that uh, at least Catholic social teaching, the Christian tradition writ large, requires us to have a liberal attitude uh, in that uh, 
every civilization, nation, community should have the exact same sets of laws or even the exact same theory of laws. Um, so when people say, well, hasn't capitalism or haven't certain free market systems uh, impacted the third world in you know, very useful ways, and I think that's possible um, to bracket from developed countries with a completely different modern experience of capitalism thanks to their um, level of development. I don't think you have to apply the same set of rules or standards to nations, communities, and societies that are in very different places and have very different traditions. Um, so, you know, just to sort of sum up, uh, I think that a good medieval resurgence uh, could be a salutary thing for thinking about um, the poor today. And that's sort of the work that I do, is focusing on that old stuff. And uh, are the, uh, is the market the best alternative for lifting up and caring for the poor? My short, <coughs> excuse me, my short answer to that is yes. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, but let me explain a little bit ab about why I believe that as an economist, but Christian first. Uh, and I think we have to go and, uh, as you mentioned, we look at the scripture and we have an undisputed call to care for the poor. I've never been in a um, conversation with Christians who debate that, as you say. It's about the means. And the means are very important. Uh, if we get the means wrong, we might unintentionally harm the poor or put them in a more vulnerable or marginalized position than they were already. So we have to be very cautious about that and look not just at the, you know, kind of what needs to be done right now, but what are the long term, how does that play out in the long term? And so for me, I think we have to go to Genesis and understand uh, God's design and his desires for his creation. And I think if you, and I would encourage everyone to go read that again if you haven't um, spent time with it recently. If you look at what God designed in his creation and us as part of it, it is, Genesis is language of abundance. Uh, we didn't have cell phones, uh, but we had abundance um, and we had all of nature and we were asked to cultivate that with our creativity and our talents. Uh, and so, you know, the question is, how do we do that? Uh, how do we serve the creation and serve each other? And how do we take the biblical responsibility to make uh, our own little contributions towards flourishing? So I think that's the goal as Christians. That we're, that's where we have to start. And we have to say then, um, well, taking people as they are, uh, and I think what, you know, Christianity sees the human person very rightly, and I think good economists do as well. They start with who is the human person and what are their constraints and their capabilities. And what we know about people is that they are fallen and sinful and self-interested and often mistaken and sometimes greedy. And so there's a lot of different errors that people make. And so the question is, what kind of economic system uh, do we require so that we can all flourish? Is there such an economic system that allows us to kind of permanently escape uh, the conditions of poverty? So I think when you think about material poverty, we have to say in the face of sin and a fallen world where our relationships with God and his creation and each other are broken, uh, we are not looking for a system that's perfect. And I don't think most people are saying we have to have perfect. Um, but to say, you know, kind of, which system gets us a utopia is not the right question. The right question is taking people in their varied complexities as they are, what kind of system induces the most flourishing and provides the most hope for the poor? Uh, and I think it is uh, universally clear that um, market-based economies, while not perfect, again, because we're always dealing at the bottom with people, always. And so the question is really, again, what kind of system incentivizes incentivizes service, incentivizes human creativity and generosity so that we're living amongst strangers and thinking and finding creative ways to serve each other. And so the economic insight is based on kind of the biblical understanding, I think, of the world and creation is that we live in a world of scarcity, which means we have to ration and nobody likes the word ration. <laughs> it brings back, you know, up really, um, I think, terrible um, memories or, or images in people's minds. You think of a food ration or uh, a gasoline ration. And, and so, you know, we don't like to ration, but we have to. Uh, it's not just about rationing. It's not just about a fixed pie where we're giving out pieces of the pie. Uh, I think that's not the case, and it's certainly not what the record of history, at least the last 250 years, has shown us. But rather, we need to ration, but we need to discover. 
Our job is to discover. Our job is to unleash our human creativity. Uh, and in doing that, we can make contributions, not just to our neighbors that we know, but to strangers that we'll never meet. And that's exciting and empowering, and I think quite possible. Uh, and you know, what does that, you know, what economic system allows us to ration and discover and engage in prudence and have enough leftovers to be generous? And it's market-oriented societies. Now, if you're looking at the alternatives, what are the other alternatives? I mean, you can have kind of a centrally planned society, a mixed economy, democratic socialism, fascism. There's kind of, you know, extreme central planning, extreme market economies, and there's all these things in between. Um, and so we have to decide what system is going to be best to alleviate um, poverty. And I think market-based economies, because they take people as they are, because we don't, we don't require a benevolent despot to uh, both know everything they need to know about what we need and how to help us flourish, but also have the right incentives to behave right all the time. Uh, because we can't find that person, uh, we need a system that does it in a decentralized way. So I think markets are really the antidote to poverty, not just because market economies allow us to temporarily have enough leftovers to engage in charitable activities, but what market economies have demonstrated that they're capable of is eliminating poverty, absolutely wiping it off the face of the planet. And that's exciting. Uh, and by the way, this is a very kind of modern claim that we're making. Uh, you know, the president of the World Bank is saying out loud in public right now that we're going to uh, be under 3% abject poverty by 2030. Now, that doesn't mean we stop. That doesn't mean we have to keep, you know, can't keep working to elevate the condition of those who are living at the bottom. But we would have never been able to say that 25 years ago. If the president of the World Bank had said that 30 years ago, he would have been kicked out of his job. And people would have laughed at him. So I think the accomplishments of markets are that they not just allow us in the short term to be generous to people who have less, which is important, but they are the antidote to poverty by helping us eliminate it. Thank you. So tell us, Michael, what does Christianity have to do with uh, poverty and the amelioration of poverty? Yeah, well, I wanna deal with the question in a few, in a few buckets. And I, I take the question pretty literally. What does Christianity have to offer the poor? It's basically the question that prompted Howard Thurman to write Jesus and the Disinherited. So he opens up the book, what is the meaning of Christianity to the man who stands with his back against the wall? The masses of men live with their backs constantly against the wall. They are the poor, the disinherited, the dispossessed. What does our religion have to say to them? And so I, I want to talk about three basic categories, Christianity, Christianity as an institution, Christianity as an idea, and Christianity as reality. Categories aren't perfect, there's overlap, but it's just a helpful way to frame my thoughts. Um, first, Christianity as an institution. Um, when I left government and started doing events and um, with, with uh, a, a book that came out called Reclaiming Hope, some took that to be a, um, a suggestion that um, government made me a, cyg a cynic. Um, I, I worked in the Office of Faith-Based Neighborhood Partnerships, um, and when people ask me if government made me a cynic, I say, how, how could it? My job every day was to work with faith-based organizations on the front lines to resource, to help them, to connect them, serve the most vulnerable. Um, that, that, that was my job, so that was my perspective as a White House staffer. Um, we are notoriously bad as Christians at quantifying our good works, I think in part because of not letting the left hand know what the right is doing, um, but there have been some recent efforts to, to do this. Um, Brian Grimm and Faith Counts recently uh, released research showing that religion in the U.S. today contributes a combined $1.2 to our economy and society, much of this in charitable giving and endeavors. Um, uh, the uh, John DiUlio and Sacred Places showed that uh, the typical urban church supplies approximately $150,000 worth of social services per congregation per year. And evidence suggests there's a kind of force multiplier, what they call a halo effect to this work, so that actually when church uh, and, and Christian institutions are partnering with government or with other public institutions, um, that increases the overall effectiveness of the social service delivery. And then finally, earlier this year, I was involved in work with 
Baylor University that researched the faith-based contribution to combating homelessness, and we found that about 60% of all emergency beds are provided by faith-based organizations. Faith-based residential recovery programs resulted in, uh, in 11 cities, uh, generated 115 million in taxpayer savings. And so the institutions motivated by Christianity, by uh, organized Christians, have much to offer the poor. It was true, uh, it's true of Christian marriages and families, churches, parachurch organizations. It's been true in the early church as described in Acts, and it's true and active now. Second quick bucket I want to discuss is Christianity as an idea. But we often take for granted the revolution, revolutionizing influence of the teachings of Jesus and the teaching of the church on questions involving injustice in the poor. Uh, Dallas Willard used to say that a society likes to beat Christians over the head with their own stick, uh, and I think that's true. Uh, but Nick Walterstorff's work has showed us that the modern conception of justice, for instance, is inextricably linked to the legacy of the Christian tradition. We, we see a trend now um, in, your, in Europe and in the States of um, wanting to uh, separate out what our uh, ideas with rich Christian legacy and take the parts that they like and sort of try and whitewash those ideas. Um, so Christians who are serving the poor, uh, well, they're just a category of good people serving the poor, um, but their being Christian isn't inherent to their service. And we need to push back on that notion. We need to push back and um, uh, assert that there's something unique about the Christian contribution to poverty. Um, and of course, I, I won't spend long on Catholic social teaching uh, due to both time and relative ignorance compared to uh, fellow panelists, but ideas like the preferential option for the poor have influenced and shaped societies um, and uh, hold uh, politicians of all economic perspectives accountable. So what Christianity has to offer as an idea is it actually um, uh, uh, people feel accountable to the idea even if they their prudential judgments are different, right? It sets boundaries around our prudential judgments. Um, but, but the last area is, is the one I want to focus on, which is that um, Christianity affirms the reality of the dignity of poor people in a way the world often does not. Christianity does not do this merely as a philosophy or a theory, but as a reflection of ultimate reality. So when I'm struck by Jesus' words in Matthew, he, he said, go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So Jesus lists resulting consequences of his ministry, of the gospel, and they are all directly responsive to felt needs. The blind see, the lame walk, the, do, the, the deaf hear, the dead have life, and the poor have money. Wait, that's not what he says. <laughs> what Jesus says here, is, which is the message of the Beatitudes, is that his kingdom is unlike any other. While the world excludes the poor, God is the maker of all things, including them. This is why the prosperity gospel is such a heresy, because it sets out the idea that in order for the poor to have dignity, in order for the poor to be loved by God, that the response to that is to have material resources, when that is that uh, Jesus' kingdom and message completely turned that theory of the world upside down, or right side up, as Dallas Willard would say. Um, so in the 22nd of Proverbs, we're told that the rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord is the maker of them all. This was revolutionary. It's common to us now. It's common in Western civilization. But that's not because Western civilization is so great. It's because of the contribution of Christianity to the way these societies develop. Um, I just want to close. If, if you approached Howard Thurman's Jesus and the Disinherited expecting a 21st century sort of um, liberal, uh, you would be very surprised. Howard Thurman recognized uh, that Christianity contains in it the resources to recognize the great forces that bear down on the poor, fear, deception, and hate. And he also said that Christianity ennobles the poor while exposing the proud as frauds. And so I just want to close with his words here. What then, Thurman wrote, is the word of the religion of Jesus to those who stand with their backs against the wall? There must be the clearest possible understanding of the anatomy of the issues facing them. They must recognize fear, deception, hatred, each for what it is. 
And once having done this, they must learn how to destroy these or to render themselves immune to their domination. In so great an undertaking, it will become increasingly clear that the contradictions of life are not ultimate. The disinherited will know for themselves that there is a spirit at work in life and in the hearts of men which is committed to overcoming the world. It is universal, knowing no age, no race, no culture, and no condition of men, for the privileged and unprivileged alike, if the individual puts at the disposal of the spirit the needful dedication and discipline, he can live effectively in the chaos of the present, the high destiny of a son of God. Thank you. Okay, so we have everything on the table. Not, a, not everything, although it, a good bit of stuff for us to talk about. I, I just ask that our questions now be more concise uh, and uh, feel free to interject even interrupt a little bit, because that's what normal people do in conversations. <laughs> but we're not going to have a food fight either, all right? Um, let me begin just to kind of tease out some of these things and tease out some of the clash. I I've often heard it said, uh, as you, you uh, alluded to, Elizabeth, uh, the assertion that somehow the liberal notion uh, with regard to private property asserts that private property is absolute. So my two questions in that regard would be, first, uh, who today is making that case? Uh, among the liberal, I'm using the term li liberal in the European and the classical sense of liberal. Who, who is making that case? Uh, the Acton Institute certainly has, uh, doesn't. Maybe Ayn Rand does. But I'm wondering who uh, does that. And secondly, um, Even if the right to private property is sacred, as I would assert, and I hope you would agree, uh, how does that um, entail the notion that it's absolute? And what other rights are absolute? Including the right to life mm -hmm. is not absolute. Mm -hmm. So throw that around and, and feel free to interject. Sure. So the early church doesn't think in terms of subjective rights, rights like a right, property right. that you own. Um, so that is a liberal imposition onto the Christian tradition that follows from um, liberal theorists having a need to explain a proprietary quality that a person has that they can invoke um, in regard to certain privileges. Um, but the early church and even the medieval church thought in the terms of one objective right. There's God's right and we all right. participate in it. Um, the notion of subjective rights, you know, I own my property right, um, is kind of an interesting thing. I mean, it does a slippery thing. It makes us all equal as proprietors. So the liberal theory of property rights says you all equally own your rights. That's the way in which you're equal. You all own the exact same set of rights to property, to liberty, to life, etc. The problem with that is <clears throat> saying that we all equally own our rights makes us equal as proprietors um, without uh, an eye to uh, what that might actually entail. Um, so even though you own your right, you might not actually have any sort of capability for invoking it or practicing it because of the way that society is stratified or institutions operate with different classes of individuals. Um, so the liberal theory of rights is sort of um, classically geared um, to establish and assert a form of equality which was a, a, a huge improvement upon the way that you know feudal institutions thought of people, um, for instance, um, but is not necessarily something that ends up generating as much equality as it might um, lead one to believe that it would relative to its assertions of equality between people. Um, and then, you know, in terms of um, who is making the claim that um, property rights are absolute, well, the, so you often hear taxation is theft. Um, taxation is theft is sort of a slogan that you hear um, in, in certain Republican precincts and among certain members of libertarian parties or people. Well, kind of like the flip side, uh, property yeah. is theft from the Marxist side. Right, right, right. And so, so the Proudhonian sort of assertion that, that property itself is theft has to do with what property is. So to establish something as private property, what I'm telling you is I'm going to get violent with you if you mess with this object. Um, and so what Proudhon would say is, well, prior to your assertion of that fact, I wasn't threatened with violence when I stepped on that object or went near that object. Um, so to perform that assertion, you are creating some sort of claim of violence or something. And, and that's where the property is theft assertion comes from. But the taxation is theft um, slogan 
is, is the modern embodiment of the theory that property rights are absolute because it ignores, um, right, that property is a civil institution and, and what is taxed uh, is legally and licitly um, the property of actually so, another so institution altogether. What's your argument about, uh, against uh, complete confiscation of people's resources, if you don't want to call it property? What's the, what's the argument? Well, we do them? completely confiscate people's resources from time to time. Um, when they're imprisoned, for example. Okay, let's um, say the arbitrary confiscation. So the, the totally arbitrary, the argument against totally arbitrary confiscation is that it's totally arbitrary. And civil authorities are supposed to conduct themselves with uh, a regard for establishing and maintaining order and stability and peace. Um, and so completely arbitrary activities are therefore provided against by the tradition. So, so but the state then could the state, I mean, there are, there are always despotic states, and, and Leo would say that even despotic states still preside over polities, um, but we would prefer that our states not be <laughs> despotic. W <laughs> yeah. Would, uh, yes, we'll agree yeah. on that too. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but uh, would you agree that property, uh, because of its proximity to the human person, mm -hmm. uh, is sacred? No. So you, you disagree with Leo XIII and Rerum Navarum? Um, I think that, the, that so to, to adopt a Thomism, sacred can be said in many ways. Um, and and what, I'm, uh, what I'm always nervous Depends on the definition of is. Right, exactly. <laughs> it's, a, it's a medieval Clintonism. Um, yeah, so, so, so what I'm always nervous about when people ask me is this or that sacred. Um, I, I'm not trying to, uh, I don't think that property, uh, which is just the material creation of the world, has a sacral quality. Um, you know, I don't like splitting up the world into sacred and profane, but there are things that are material and there are things that are not. Um, I think that, you know, the more, the more, the correct thing to speak of is, you know, is the dignity of the human person sacred? And, and that proximity to the person gives it a sacredness. And, and the dependence and the creation of what they draw from the resources of the natural world because of that Right, right. So, so the, the church then says, well, so because you have to rely on the material world, there has to be some connection to it that is respected in the realm, in the sort of penumbra of the sacredness of the dignity of the human being. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that you know, can be pretty closely um, circumscribed by and, the needs of others. And what, what, where do you see the, the connection of the knowledge problem mm -hmm. in the Hayekian sense uh, applying to this whole question of serving the poor and serving the poor not just in terms of making resources available right. to the poor but in knowing what the poor really need because you can make a lot of things available to people that that aren't essentially what they need mm -hmm. and what they subjectively see themselves as needing. Right, so this idea that um, yeah, I think it comes from the idea that has really manifested itself in economics and mainstream economics over the 20th century is that the economy is an engineering problem and that you know if we get really smart engineers then we can solve the problem and so I think it fundamentally comes down to the way we think about poverty. Uh, material poverty is in part uh, a lack of kind of necessary consumption, right? I can't, I don't have shelter, I don't have food, I don't have healthcare, I don't have a lot of things, and so that constrains me in very extreme ways and excludes me. Um, and yes, that is part of, you know, kind of that's the, um, the way poverty is manifested, but what is the root cause of that? And the root cause of that is that there's a, there's a set of institutions that are dysfunctional that are not empowering people to be enabled to unleash their human creativity. And so that is a really hard thing to fix. Um, and so that Hayekian insight here is that, you know, his insight in general about economics was that, you know, knowledge is decentralized. And so you need a mechanism across varied people who don't know each other and cannot f possibly find a way to acquire the knowledge that doesn't exist in one pot. Uh, we need a way to discover the information that we need to know. And so for him in economics, it was prices. They give us a lot of information. Uh, and, and so the problem is if you establish a bureaucracy, and by the way, it doesn't have to be a federal or governmental bureaucracy. It can be a nonprofit organization. Um, the problem with it, you know, the, um, saying, well, we need to help in this arena is we have to understand what the underlying institutional dysfunction is. Um, and it's very rare that we, in whatever these institutions are, can go in and say, do these things and it will be fixed. Uh, because often what need, what is broken is kind of the underlying kind of 
again, economic, political institutions, values, norms that people hold, and these are uh, causing groups of people to be exploited or excluded. And so I think we have to stop viewing poverty as a technical problem. As you say, it's very easy. You know, in, in um, the United States, we have, for example, lots of clean water, excessive amounts, right? We have, you know, the grocery stores close at night and the shelves are not empty. So there's a lot of extra. And we can view places that experience um, natural disasters and say they need clean drinking water. So it is very much an easy thing to say we have a lot of it and we know how to get it to people who don't have a lot of it. Uh, and, and so that is part of generosity, I think, a necessary thing. Uh, and that's a technical problem, right? We're taking water from a place that has a lot to, to not a lot. But I think in the long term, the solution to ending poverty is how do you get underneath uh, uh, the, the problem of the institutions, and that's a much harder thing. So I think the Hayekian insight is that we can't fix it uh, in some ways, you know, from a, 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 in a technocratic sense. Uh, and so then that begs the bigger question of... Uh, and, and also proximity absolutely. is required to that. Th this kind of comes into the whole question and the concerns that I've had uh, with government and, uh, subsidy for charity, and, and particularly I've written extensively under... Clinton, Bush, and Obama, and now Trump, against the office that you presided over. You wouldn't have had your job if I had my way, ever. <laughs> you wouldn't have. But now, tell me where, and I'll throw this out to you to start it, but uh, I'm no. interested in, in your, where does subsidiarity fall into this in terms of the knowledge question uh, of knowing did you, you didn't despair when you saw those people in those communities, as you said, but can you, can you fess up that maybe there were moments of despair when you saw the bureaucracy obfuscate the knowledge of what people really needed and just wanted to give them something else? Um, uh, I can fess up to the fact that I saw uh, uh, a plethora of ways in which government isn't working. Um, uh, I can, uh, what I am concerned about is, um, is, is what is the alternative. Uh, and so, um, uh, what's important to understand about, especially nonprofit and faith based money, is even the federal money is primarily distributed through states and localities, and that money is, is, distributed through primary grantees, and then those grantees decide who the sub-grantees are. So many times when we talk about federal money going down to faith-based charities, it's not uh, federal government, um, they're not federal agents sort of entering these cities, it's Catholic charities of a local diocese partnering with local faith-based organizations yeah. in their area that submit a proposal that is based on local knowledge of what is needed. And there's an application process and there are, um, there are uh, constraints. Uh, certainly government programs have to be written so that applicants are meeting uh, government criteria and we could government have a criteria. conversation about what, what that looks like so, so in how words, arbitrary or unnecessary some government criterions are. Um, so, so the local charity is jockeying for what the government's saying is the criteria. And that's the knowledge problem. That's exactly what I'm, I'm trying to get to. Yeah, well, right, so it's, um, uh, so, so it, uh, it sets a, um, it sets uh, out criteria, um, uh, but it, it, it's important to speak in a, in a concrete way. So, right, so I think there's, um, the federal government has an amazing capacity to um, to influence the social service sector. That's the uh, problem. Well, 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 that that is the pro well, well, right. And I'm I'm acknowledging that. Okay. I think I think the the pro of that is the ability to marshal resources. That if these organizations were left uh, to uh, uh, and right, they are, they're able to function individually based on money that doesn't come from government, but the government is able to direct resources in a way that local organizations but where's don't the government have the resources getting that money or knowledge from? to do so. From the taxpayer. Where's the government getting that money from? Right, from the taxpayer. For, uh, yeah. Who are the donors to these philanthropies? Well, no, no, no that's, that's not true. That's not true no? in every instance, no, no. of course not. You, you, you don't think that there are any taxpayers that aren't donating to Catholic charities? 
No, no, no. I, what I'm saying is that. No, I, I know what you're saying, but no. but the 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 idea that um, the idea that if uh, faith-based programs uh, that social federal uh, government-sponsored social service delivery programs did not exist, um, that all of the slack from that. Is, is purely money that would otherwise be donated directly to charities is, is not true. Well, you're not saying that the, if a million dollars is granted by the federal government to um, um, food program, that it's a million dollars worth of food that gets to the poor, right? You're not saying that. So, I, so it's interesting. So I, I tell a, uh, I tell a, well, so right, so it wouldn't be the same case if the money got donated to Catholic Charities or to any any organization. Far, I, I, far I, less handling fee. Well, especially if you so have nuns it, it's running the program. So I, so I, I tell a so I tell a story uh, in my book. Um, I had uh, religious leaders meeting with the uh, director of U.S. Aid, and he was telling them about the program that we had called Feed the Future, and he delivered his presentation on, on this program that was uh, going to address global hunger. And he, he, he wrapped it up uh, and he, he gave a number for how many uh, dollars it would take to feed uh, each family of four in the service provision. Uh, one member at this meeting, uh, r the first question right after the administrator uh, presented, uh, uh, asks the head of one of the, one of the largest poverty organizations in the world, uh, asks him, you, uh, what would it take for you to do the same, the same, conduct the same services? And of course he was teeing him up for exactly this thing and, and not just teeing him up intellectually, but uh, uh, sort of in your personal interest, if you're the head of, a, of an organization that does this work, your personal interest is going to be, of course we could do it cheaper. Um, he didn't say that. In instead, what he said was, we have a giant problem. He said, I don't know if my organization could do it cheaper or not, um, but I don't think that we're in a position to be, uh, I know my organization can't take care of all of the problem, and so, uh, uh, so I, I think we need an all-hands-on-deck approach, and it diffused the entire issue. So, so I, I would say I think there are certain circumstances in which service delivery could be done cheaper the, the more local it is. Um, and that's a yeah. benefit of local charities. Now, I think to, the, the scope and to be able to have the, uh, the broad knowledge and resources of where to target those resources, the federal government and governments have resources to be able to make the identification that aren't available yeah, to I, local. I'm not, I'm not trying to overemphasize the, um, just the material substance sustenance, but the, the knowledge of the real problems and, and the drain both financially and through the tax system on people who might be otherwise either disposed or incentivized to participate in that amelioration. And more importantly, the assumption that there are these outside resources who are relatively distant from the problem, creating disincentives on the part of local people who have some resources. What do you think about the principle of subsidiarity? So I think the principle of subsidiarity is very important, um, and it's certainly articulated in Catholic social teaching as having a primary role in how we go about allocating resources charitably. I think that the issue that we're kind of confronting here is, you know, when you look at all the problems that have just come up in your discussion with Michael, um, certain nuns can do things cheaply in a way that, you know, a SNAP office can't. Um, why can't the government just distribute to the nuns? Well, Bush wanted to do that. I, I wasn't advocating. Oh, no, I was, I was, I was, I'm, I'm throwing that out there. Um, because certainly in the Middle Ages, the church did act as a welfare agency. Um, Pippin the Short uh, had his armies go collect tithes um, because the church, uh, the state, you know, didn't want to spend all their money dealing with poor people, although they, the kings did give uh, prolifically to the church. Um, so they just said, you know what, we'll help you out. We'll make people remit their tithes. Um, that's the 10% that comes out per the Lateran councils before um, you're taxed. Um, and so armies, you know, would go around and do it. Um, and so this is, just a, this is just a tax. This is just the civil government instituting a tax that then goes to the church to act as a welfare agency. Um, so that used to be the run of things, and I think that made a lot of sense. The reason we can't do it now is because it's unconstitutional, because we're a liberal democracy. 
Um, and so we're confronting all these problems, like why can't we do things in a way that makes a lot of sense? Um, why don't we know what people need? I'm not sure that big philanthropies know what people need. Um, I'm not sure that even if you've lived next door to someone, you know what they need. Um, and the reason is because, again, we live in a liberal democracy. People come, people go, industrial capitalism pushes people out of the countryside into the cities and then into different cities and different regions. This is Polanyi's point in the Great Transformation. Industrial capitalism is the only lasting reformation. It upended a total way of life. Um, that had been, uh, that had obtained for thousands of years was completely toppled and will never go back the way it was. Um, and that is where people knew each other, where the world was dominated by small, tight-knit communities. Now it's dominated by large urban centers and it's gonna continue in that direction because capital likes to pull up into big population centers. And it also likes to move around. Um, and so because we have all of these institutions that have come out of liberal democracy, the complete separation of church and state, um, the complete separation of even um, church authority from civil authority, and even the, the mindset that allows us to have those sentences make sense um, was, a, was a creation of liberal democracy. The fact that people are uprooted, uh, isolated, atomized, continually on the move in search of better prospects instead of rooted to place, that's an aspect of liberal democracy. The problems that we have are not accidents of liberal democracy. They're what liberal democracy intended. So, so your description of all this is quite dismal. Yes. Right, I picked that up. Augustine. <laughs> so, and, and, and if you, you buy Polanyi, not Michael Polanyi, by the way. Carl. <laughs> um, uh, if your description of that is accurate, uh, how is it that the poor are not worse off today? So worse off today compared to? Any other time in history. Take your choice. Okay. So if the poor. I mean, isn't that the most obvious thing? Yeah. Um, so the poor have benefited um, from technology in a lot of cases um, as technology has become cheaper. Um, if the poor in the United States, if the poorest people in the United States, my husband grew up homeless, for instance, um, is as good as a peasant in 1350, I'm not sure that's a major improvement because the rich today are certainly far better off than um, kings well, in the 1350s. So, I mean, if Well, the middle not class are better off than kings. Yeah, moving up together. Yeah. Not um, just. But I mean, if, if you want to take it, if you want to take it. What does that matter? That, uh, the relative that, gap, I think, is the, is the primary. Why, why is the relative gap your moral concern? Because the gap, and, and why is the ceiling your moral concern? So why isn't it just the floor that's your moral concern? Well, so excess is excess is not necessarily a good thing for people. That um, may be, but that, that may um, very so the well. Be. A I, I hear it in confession all the time. Yes. And impose penances <laughs> to that end. Yeah. But that's not what we're talking about. We're not just talking about the moral obligation of people who have incredible resources, including all of us on this stage. Sure. What we're talking about here is the well-being of the poorest of the poor. That's right. the floor, not the gap. So I think that um, trying to uh, bring up a floor to a certain level, um, based on a utilitarian calculus, the poor have TVs, refrigerators, and so on. No, I was thinking food. I was yeah, thinking yeah, sure, longevity. Sure. I was thinking um, medicine. I was thinking housing. Right, but I was this thinking is, clothing. This is further to your point that they have even more than basics, typically in the United States. Um, they have more than basic necessities. They All have, over the world. Right. Well, yes, in lots of places in the world. Um, yeah, okay, not North Korea. But I think it's fair to, I think it's fair to limit our discussion, um, especially in use of Catholic tradition, to particular polities and not compare unlike things. Um, but I, I think that the gap between the rich and poor and the size of it is actually very important, uh, and morally, because the size of the gap between the rich and poor um, is sort of a measure of what is being controlled. Um, by a small number of people versus a, a large number of people. My focus is on the poor. Mm -hmm. if, if Bill Gates has a lot more money than Warren Buffett, mm -hmm. I'm still concerned about the poor. Right. So that gap can exist, and, and my assertion, and from your economic perspective, perhaps you bring some, some uh, perspective to this, my assertion is that never before in all of human history has humanity been better off than it is now, other than maybe, as I say, in North Korea or in socialist Venezuela, yeah, sure. where these models, you know, isn't that just obvious that something has happened roughly 200 years ago that has to do, by the way, with the, the, the liberal definition of private property that I heard you decry earlier, that tells us that there's something that we're doing right. What about the fortunes of the church in the last 200 years? The which? The church. Look what's happened to religious adherence. <laughs> yes. I mean, that's liberalism. That's liberalism working. Liberalism does amazing well, things, and it also does other things. Or statism. Or, 
or statism. Or, I mean, what uh, is statism? The, the 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 churches that you're describing that are on on the uh, on the downfall are precisely those that are closest to the philosophy, the ideology, of the left. What is what are, what are we counting as the left? I'm, I'm talking about okay. Well, I'm talking about the right and the left in the United I, I'm, States. I'm I'm talking about um, a, a liberalism as an economy, as a free economy, versus a liberalism. The, the, the distinction that Newman makes between kinds of liberalism. Right, there's political, social, and economic, and right. they all go together. Right. Well, they don't all go together. They, you can try to separate them, but they go together because they share a psychology, a way of thinking about people and anthropology as atomized individuals with proprietary subjective rights. I, I think that John Paul has given the lie to that. <laughs> it, it, his whole anthropology of the human person is the creative one who uh, has uh, and has the right to personal initiative, mm -hmm. which is why the free initiative uh, gives the lie to that, that, that there is a way of blending a properly understood liberal idea with a Christian anthropology. There are ways of pulling back from liberalism what it took away from Christianity to begin with. Christianity, uh, no, Walsh I, I says, is exactly a child wrong. of liberalism. I think the best of liberalism or the other way around. Was, was the foundation of Christianity, right. the best of the liberal ideas. But why do we need the, what, what is liberalism giving to us in the Christian tradition that we didn't have before? By, by itself, well, it's giving us, I think this is the economic question. So I, I It's allowing us to live into what we're asked to do in scripture. Mm. So it's a mechanism by which that we can do what we're supposed to do. So income is not about rank, it's about level. And so, I mean, to your point, the distinction between what Bill Gates makes and what I make is not important to me to the extent that the way Bill Gates makes his money is ethical and it, it abides by certain principles, which is that he has to wake up in the morning and think about how to bring computing services to somebody like me who could not possibly figure that out on my own. And so the idea is that consumers are, are rewarding these firms as they see fit in a voluntary way. Now, I think it would be, um, absurd to claim that none of this has problems, you know, kind of excessive right. consumption and the, the just, you know, kind of desire always to have the next thing, I have to have the next iPhone and all this stuff. Um, but that is a very personal issue and I'm not sure that we have a way kind of via um, law or the state that's going to solve that problem. I think those are disastrous. And so, you know, th that's where Christianity plays the most important role is that, you know, Christ is the center uh, of our, our aspirations and our heart. But uh, from an economic perspective, I mean, here's just a little anecdote. The first cell phone was sold in 1984 in the United States, handheld cell phone. And it was kind of the thing that you'd see in a pawn shop or you'd laugh at and right now. It's this big, huge thing. It was $3,995, 1984. So only the super rich had this thing, right? And we would not dare to carry this unless we were making a point. Um, it, or a weightlifter. Or a weightlift, <laughs> right. Right, so in, in 2017, you know, kind of one of the best race rated phones is the Samsung S8 or something, and it's $585. And if you adjust it for inflation, it's even more astounding. So inflation adjusted in 1985 or 84, it was $10,000. And so, and if you adjust it for quality, we're not even talking about the same thing because the, the two phones have nothing in common except that they call, right? That's it. I mean, on my phone, I could have, you know, my groceries delivered to my hotel by the time we're done. So uh, the thing is though about markets is that they extend their benefits, the benefits of human creativity in a very egalitarian way. And the insight here is that it's not just the Bill Gates, I mean, you know, uh, Yes, economists have put it this way, it's the distinction between going from zero pairs of pants to one is profound. Going from six pairs to 600 is no big deal. You know, so Bill Gates has a lot more pairs of pants than I do, but I have pants and I'm not a billionaire. Isn't that wonderful, right? So that's the point. There's an egalitarian um, uh, distribution and uh, you know an ability for people at the very bottom of the in income quintile to have cell phones and by the way in the developing world this is uh, revolutionary right now and the natives are getting restless yes, so yeah. uh, Paul would you come up here and let's um, we'll release some of the pressure off the kettle and, uh, <laughs> let you get into the conversation I should hope so. And um, lots of things being voted up. 
When we talk about the poor, must we assume we're always referring to the materially poor? What about relational poverty and other forms of <laughs> poverty? Well, of course. You know, I mean, that, that's a given. I, I don't know that there's a big debate on that unless you want to. Yes. Uh, that the, and, and then there's kinds of poverty. There's voluntary poverty, involuntary poverty. And uh, so uh, when, when we're uh, uh, speaking about spiritual detachment, you can be a complete free marketer and say, uh, just because I can buy it and should be uh, able to buy it, that I morally shouldn't buy it. You know, so th there's no, no debate. I don't see us. What one, one head of a, a local uh, uh, service agency said that, uh, in her experience, uh, the poor people don't hit dire straits when they run out of money. It's when they run out of relationships, mm -hmm. um, which, which I think speaks to, speaks to your, mm -hmm. your question. How does a minimum wage affect poverty? Should Christians support or oppose government intervention into the market in an attempt to fix poverty? So those are two questions, right? So minimum yeah, wage? Yeah, I think they're two. I think there's the specific element of the minimum wage mm -hmm. that maybe the fix people think about. Do you want to talk about Sure. Yeah, wages? I'd love to. Uh, I think this is one of those ideas that sounds good on paper. It sounds great on paper. And um, the unfortunate uh, outcome of it is that if it was easy to just um, extend people's income, which was what we want for the poor, right? We want them to be able to not just experience the necessary consumption, but perhaps have alternatives beyond that. Uh, and so if it were easy, then I su suspect we would have already done that and we would have already attained lots of the benefits of it. And so the question is, if it's easy, we've been engaging in the minimum wage, by the way, for quite some time now, uh, and it hasn't seemed to be effective. And the reason is, you know, kind of the economic insights are that it, it creates, um, it, you, when you increase this, the price of something, people demand less of it, all else equal. And so the problem with the minimum wage is that uh, the burden, especially on you know, kind of um, small companies, mom and pop corporations who are only hiring a few people, it puts kind of them into a bind where now they have to decide, you know, I can't hire as many people, or maybe I can't pay them the benefits, or maybe I have to, you know, kind of do some of the work myself. So these unintended consequences tend to be that the people that are that in there are the most need of the help. The people that have the lowest level of skill and the lowest level of education relative to others tend to get marginalized by this. And that's not what we want. So we have to look at not just the intentions, but the unintended consequences. Uh, and so the way to raise people's incomes is to help people become more productive. And so how do we increase the productivity of labor? There's many ways we do that. There's education, there's, you know, some of this do, is done through the market, but much of it is done outside of the market. And so I don't think it's just a market response, but I think, you know, uh, and even the proposals that I see about minimum wage, we see this in Seattle, $15 an hour minimum wage. I mean, I don't think if we really care for the poor, I mean, we should be advocating for a $50 an hour minimum wage. I mean, if we really want to help people, why, 50? why is it, or why not 100? 100? 100. I mean, exactly. So $15 is, you know, roughly $30,000 a year. This is, if you're supporting a family, it's very hard to live on that. And so why don't we hear people agitating for something that's actually really helpful? It's because at the end of the day, there's no resources for that. And so the consequences, you're going to put lots you, of you want to counter this? enterprises out of business. Well, you know, I, I think I do want to um, I, I think often from, I think often uh, uh, people who share roughly the economic views of, of Liz and I are accused of a sort of uh, utopianism. Um, and and I, I just think it's important to point out the utopianism inherent in the idea that uh, uh, the freer the markets are, sort of the, um, the more perfect the system will be, especially when that's detached to the actual concrete um, uh, uh, welfare of the people involved. In other words, I, I think it's important not to, um, $30,000 is hard to live on, um, but if, uh, if, if you're making less than that, as, as, as my mother did when I was a young child, 30,000, oftentimes these minimum wages are tagged to what the poverty line is. Oftentimes these, um, and so, you know, let, let's not, um, uh, uh, there's not an uh, arbitrariness to how these things are set. And so I, I just wanna- But there, uh, there are when, consequences. When we have, when we have, well, right, but when we have these discussions um, that are, uh, uh, 
held to economic ideals, no matter what the economic ideal is, um, I, I think we can, we can lose track of the immediate welfare of the people that we're talking about. So it's fine to have economic theories, but um, if we're talking about um, uh, whether to raise or lower the minimum wage, that exists now. So, so, right, so, so to get out of theory, we have a federal minimum wage. The discussion now is whether to raise it or keep it where it is, which is uh, completely uh, separate from uh, uh, where, the, where the poverty line due to, uh, 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 due to uh, changes in standard of living and, and uh, I'm sorry, changes in um, uh, inflation, but it's not tagged inflation. Um, that's, that's an entirely different conversation. No, but you, you're saying it, it, this kind of discussion or concentration on economic um, arguments can help us to lose sight of the vulnerable. But isn't it conceivable that our opposition to a minimum wage is precisely to focus on the vulnerable, to oh, say that there are consequences Absolutely. to a $50 an hour minimum wage? I, I do that to make it clearer, because I think a, an $8 minimum wage, you don't see the effect as clearly as you would see it uh, at, at $50. Well, well, right, but maybe that's society uh, making a judgment that a certain level of cost is justified giving people a base level of income. Well, in in well, other words, it, 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 what you're doing by saying a $50 minimum is to... Uh, is again to, to uh, take the argument out of the practical and into a, th a, a theoretical. It's to use the reducto ad absurdum, which right. is a, va a valid form of argumentation. <laughs> it's to say, here are the consequences of your good intentions. Aren't there better ways to help the very people that we both agree need this assistance. Well, it's also, it's also a little bit disingenuous to, so we have the minimum wage conversation about poor people because of the profusion of wage labor. Um, and, and it certainly is in the social teaching of the church that there should be dignified wages for labor and you should be able to have a family wage. I think it was John Ryan's um, term. But, but if you go back to the scholastics, where right. he was drawing from in the first place, the, the living wage or, or the just wage was the market wage. They didn't have wages. The, the, they were dealing with people who were peasants. They were serfs. They weren't doing wage labor. They were living off of the land. The, they, they, the, um, the scholastics discussed all of this. We, we, that's, where, that's where Ryan got it from. Right, so the wage labor that we have in industrial capitalism, the per hour um, pay you get just for doing whatever I tell you for a certain amount of time, um, and we give it to you in currency that you can then trade for other things um, out in the marketplace, that is a, you know, a kind of new innovation. This was not something that um, would have been especially typical, uh, at least especially in the early Middle Ages, was getting more typical in the late Middle Ages, especially after the um, Black Plague. But, but they... they they looked at labor as something that, like you said, you know, is essentially creative and is essentially productive. Um, and, and even if they didn't usually have that in practice, that was at least something that was a part of the way, the landscape of their thinking about dignified work and sustenance. Now we tend to think of work as this sort of thing that you have to do, this drudgery that you go do at someone else's behest, um, and then they give you a little bit of money. Um, and tell you to get out of here. And, and so I think that you, know, you have to step back from the minimum wage problem and say, why isn't it possible for more people um, to, to have kind of a distributor set up? Why isn't it possible for more people to kind of have their own businesses where they can be you know, creative and exercise some amount of control over their schedule and, and their income? Why is it that when we discuss poverty, we are pretty much only discussing low-waged labor? And that's because of the way the economy is shaped from the bottom up by industrial capitalism. Did you want to? Sure, just one thing I would say is that it's wage labor is what has emancipated people out of poverty. I mean, it's what has taken people off of subsistence farming. I mean, if, if we want to farm, we now have that choice. But I have a choice also to you know, be an economist. To, you know, uh, we have these choices because we get to choose how to sell our labor. It's, it's, a, it's an important uh, but nuanced point that I think, think we shouldn't forget. And so what do we want for the poor? I think we want them the ability to choose to sell their labor in a way that they seek fulfillment. I totally agree with you that it becomes drudgery. And I think it's because we get away from the Christian's perspective on work, which is that we're created to work and to be creative. But the fact that that happens in, in, within the exchange of money doesn't dehumanize it or undignify it. It just makes it actually incentivized to be more productive. Paul? How does 
both the church and the government keep or avoid becoming paternalistic towards the poor. How did you do that? Tell <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah, so uh, I think, uh, think a few things. I think it's, um, I think it's very uh, difficult to avoid paternalizing uh, the poor um, outside of the kingdom theology of Jesus. Um, and so, right, so you think about all the ways in which the poor are paternalized, both from, uh, from those who would suggest um, that their material lack is somehow fundamentally tied to their, to their dignity as people. But then you also think of the paternalization that comes um, from tying, uh, I think of uh, the way in which the uh, Pharisees, uh, I, I think of the way in which uh, the woman who anointed Jesus was oil uh, was told she would be better, better spent uh, 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 giving, or the, the person giving the alms would be better spent using their resources uh, uh, to serve the poor. Right. Um, so, so that's a paternalization that comes from, uh, from another perspective. So uh, from, from government, I think we need to be really, really specific uh, and careful about uh, it is not paternalistic to uh, let me be concrete. We have a summer food service program. The summer food service program um, works in a way uh, the government provides the food, um, but faith-based organizations and others, but mostly faith-based organizations, offer a site. So there's no financial change. Goods are sent. We have thousands of uh, service uh, delivery outlets. Those outlets are able to uh, uh, give out food in a, in a local way. Um, the poor receiving, receiving uh, resources that they need is not uh, inherently paternalistic to them, whether it's coming from the government or coming from a faith-based charity. In this way, it's coming from a partnership between the two. And I think we need to, I think a lot of the talk of paternalization comes from a place of um, often internal insecurity about how we would f feel if we were without materials. I, I, I think it is much more likely that you have a paternalistic mentality on the part of the government because even that program, which I know nothing about, undoubtedly has all kinds of requirements on those churches as to who and what the priorities are and what the goals are in, in this distribution program, whereas, um, uh, a woman uh, who I knew about who used to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in her kitchen for her kids, and then the kids' friends who needed, she made more, and then she made more, and before you knew it, she was making 300 sandwiches a day for these people. And she would give a half a sandwich to one who needed a half a sandwich and give two sandwiches to another. This is not paternalism, in her case, it was maternalism, but it was fraternalism. And the difference between in this use is that the paternalistic attitude is more removed and superior, and the fraternal attitude or sororal attitude is much more mutual and individual and perceives what the needs are because you're acting as a neighbor rather than acting with a bureaucratic mentality. And uh, this isn't to say the bureaucrats are bad people. <laughs> I, I like you. I mean, we, we, we have to go and, and have some good Italian food together. Yeah. You know, that would be really great. <laughs> but we will know each other in that right. process and not be I, dictated you know, to by somebody who's choosing the menu for I, us. I, th I think the... Um, so so I, I should just be clear. I, I have no... Um, I have no obligation to government programs to serve the poor. I, I, I only want the government to serve the poor if the poor need serving. Um, and so... Why and do so, we even have to bring the government into this? Why don't we just kind of keep our focus on the poor? Well, well, because, no, you can't, you, can't, you, you can't say leave the government out. If everyone just did what they should, the poor would be fed. But then, but then like, the poor aren't being fed. 
And so the, the question is, the question is, what, what are we, what are we, what are we doing to get well, people what they? In other well, words, by the way, they are being yeah. fed by a market economy. That what oh, what has really? what has raised the standard of living yeah. and the caloric intake of people all around the world has not been government. the United Nations or government. Uh, or state to state aid. I don't but know. I think business. government. Res I think government-funded research has done a lot to figure out uh, how to increase corn growth, so that the world. That, that's not private. And, 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 <laughs> capital, and capitalism was allowed to flourish because states started managing contracts in a different way than they ever had before. You mean they began protecting property rights? <laughs> well, so prior, <laughs> so prior to the Reformation. Um, you're right, the Protestant Reformation did a lot um, for property rights that our church had, um, had not accepted. And one of those <laughs> Tell things that was, to Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> one of those things is that Aquinas would agree with was that um, prior to the Protestant Reformation, for a contract to obtain, there had to be a casus, which was a piece of Roman law that the Catholic Church had inherited. There had to be a moral reason for the contract to exist. You couldn't contract with someone, I'm going to kill you, you're going to like it, and we're going to be good, and they sign up, okay. And then you do it, and they don't die, and you go to court. The court would say, in, you know, an ecclesial court would say, absolutely not, this contract never should have existed, there's no causes. Um, and you can see after the Reformation, um, there's actually a great new book out edited by John Rao, um, in which an essay on this very subject appears by a, a Catholic legal scholar. But you can see following the Reformation, um, liberal property rights theory starts entering into courts and they start saying, well, though there was no reason for this contract to exist, um, nonetheless, you did make a contract. You say I, one of the examples is someone contracted to use a land but was pushed off of it by war. And so he never got to make income off of it, but his landlord still wanted him to pay. So he went to court and said, look, I, I couldn't do this. It's not my fault. Um, and the court said, yeah, under, under previous natural law type jurisdiction, we would have said, yeah, the, the cause here was sort of negated by some circumstances that followed. Um, but because we're going to take up an absolutist tack nowadays, um, you do have to pay even though you got no use. And so there you have a person who winds up totally destroyed by a, by a more absolutist approach to property rights and contracts especially um, than had ever existed before. So this is a government intervention in the allocation and management of property and contracts that allows um, capitalism to arise. So it's not as though there's no government in capitalism. There is an entire government bureaucracy underneath capitalism flitching the levers, making it work. Well, and, and we could have a, a long and interesting discussion about crony capitalism, mm -hmm. you know, well, th which is, is different capitalism. than property <laughs> rights, which is different than the rule of law. Mm -hmm. But let's bring in. Uh, should we lobby the state to protect the poor from payday loans, lottery tickets, and other sin taxes? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. No. no. <laughs> Next. <laughs> you wanted the clash. <laughs> there, there yeah, right. <laughs> Diversity. Do, do you want? Do you want to go into this? What do you think? Yeah. No. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> what I think. What I think is that. Um, of course, that's a cluster of, of questions. Uh, Why don't we stick with payday loans, maybe? Yeah, payday loans is a is a good way. I, I think payday loans. Uh, while I, uh, I would urge our organizations, that is nonprofit church organizations, to provide an alternative mm -hmm. so as to bring down uh, interest rates, I think that payday loans are a wonderful service for people who have no collateral, who have no background, who have no opportunities. It's not like, don't, uh, you know, abolish payday loans and we've solved the problem. These people need money, they need money now. They have limited resources and people are going to loan money to people at great risk and get it back. Uh, and, and hopefully what happens, and what in fact happens with most of those people is they learn that it's not so good to have this furniture that you're paying $40 a week on because if you can begin to accumulate a little bit of it or have some kind of organization that helps you to accumulate a little bit of it, you can own the furniture outright. Uh, I think there are alternatives, but I think taking it away doesn't solve the problem, mm -hmm. at least on the... Uh, Agreed. And it's, you know, kind of the underlying question is why are they in this situation in the first place? And so it's payday loans are temporary, but right. not long-term solutions. So the long-term solution, again, is how do you get more income? And let me and throw some gasoline on the fire, just because nobody thought <laughs> to ask it. Uh, but I would say there's a similar principle with regard to child labor. 
we think that we can just fix the problem of child labor. In this country, by the way, the problem is that children don't labor enough. Uh, but we, we think that, that, that by making laws in Thailand to abolish child labor, that we've, we've sent these kids off to nice schools. And that's not what happens. That if they can't work in a factory, usually with their parents, in, in homes and things like that, that what ends up happening is they're trafficked. And, and you know that if you've, you've worked with trafficking. Uh, so I, I think that uh, these kinds of things need to be looked at with a different lens, but with a moral concern, not just with the economic concern, but, but the effects, the consequences, again, of, of good and well-intended legislation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'm glad I convinced you. Yep. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, poverty remained constant for most of human history. Post-liberal property rights, global poverty has declined massively. Is this a coincidence? No, it's not a coincidence. That's not a question? No. How is it not a question? Uh, it's not a coincidence. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, not a coincidence. Okay. Yeah. It's not. Okay. So, so, I mean, so are many other, other things that yeah, came with I mean, liberal democracy. Right. And, um, yeah, I think we've sexual revolution was always going to happen. Desaad saw it right off the bat at the French Revolution. Um, the state of the family, the state of well, governance, um, the sort of dissolution of um, religious belief, especially if you look at Europe where liberal democracy has um, been spreading for a long time. Um, that was always going to happen and in some cases sort of celebrated by liberal theorists and, and capitalism transforming the way that people live their lives was just a piece of that puzzle. And that's a negative? I Yes, I think so. You think so? Um, not the drop in poverty. That was one of the good things about um, liberalism, sort of like overturning some of the, you know, liberalism is, is a complicated thing. So it's neither, you know, necessarily good, necessarily bad. It's just the epoch we live in. And so it's going to have problems and it's going to have advantages, just like the Middle Ages did, just like late antiquity and just like early antiquity. And so Your analysis, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but your analysis sounds something like um, uh, Engels, uh, the origin of the family private property in the state. Just that kind of brief historical look at the trajectory of society sounds like that. Do, do you do you agree with Marx and Engels in that? Oh, I, I haven't read it. Um, I haven't read it. I uh, I can't claim it. All right. So more more of a Christopher Lash type. Yeah. Okay. Say. That yeah. would be. To the degree that he claimed Engels, I probably would be comfortable. But <laughs> be borrowing from it. Yeah. Go ahead. Is there a way the intellectual elite can engage and include the poor and impoverished in our discussions of mm. how to help them? And I want to add a question that's similar to it. The US president stated he does not want poor people serving in his cabinet. How do Christians reconcile that? Poor people are image bearers of God with gifts for enterprise. <laughs> so those are two questions? Yes, but it's, it, I, I think they're, both of those questioners are trying to get at what role can the poor play in helping solve their own problems? Yeah. Well, I, I think it's about Obama and not Trump, but I don't know. Yeah, so, uh, so I think the, uh, I think the, uh, the recent resurgence that we've seen of civic engagement, and we, we, could, we would all have critiques of certain expressions of that uh, and certain ways that it's lived out, but I am generally encouraged by the level of people of uh, particularly poor people and people who generally haven't been included in, uh, in our sort of democratic processes engaging um, and, and the, uh, the explosion of ways in which they are able to engage. Um, and I think we need to be very, um, it is for that reason that we need to be uh, and stand strongly against um, both uh, sort of uh, changing of norms that so, for instance, uh, uh, members of Congress uh, pulling back from community engagement and engaging completely digi digitally or through staff or that kind of thing, or through law, through, um, through attacks against voter uh, voting rights. But um, I, I think th I th I'm looking for innovation um, in the area of civic engagement that I think uh, some of the in innovations have taken place by um, promoted by um, uh, the sort of next generation of community organizers is a, is a very productive thing. 
I would add one thing, which is I don't think that, you know, however, you, you, when we refer to the poor, I worry about what we mean when we say that, but people who have very low incomes and access to the things they need, uh, they do not need, what was the phrase, elite intellectuals? They don't need them. Um, you know, if people have inherent creativity because they are made in the image of God and they come with dignity. They don't get dignity from their income. They don't get it from their state. They con that comes with a package. And so the idea is how do you unleash that creativity? And in that, people are fulfilled and they thrive. They do not need elite intellectuals at all. And I think that's part of the engineering problem is that we can fix them. They do not need us to fix them. Yeah, yeah. They need to be freed. Amen. Shall we do one more? Yes. You're, you're in control of the time, so. Well, let's do one. I, I just want to leave a minute and a half for everybody to just make a closing. Okay, remark. let's do this one and then do that. Okay. Uh, clearly, the millennials in the audience are bothered, Father, by your comment about feelings. And this question keeps oh. saying, I'm <laughs> so sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> Wanted to Go and live in Brooklyn for a few months. <laughs> oh, no, I'm sorry. They're doing that now. Oh. <laughs> The question is, do feelings have a place in public discourse as long as they are used as guideposts rather than the core mode of discussion? Huh. No, I mean, I think the question is... No, I mean, <laughs> feeling, feelings have a place in all social engagements because we're human beings. As of course feelings have a place. But feelings are not the way in which we think. Right? Our, our feelings need to be guided by our reason. Our, our appetites need to be guided by our reason. And, uh, you know, sometimes I feel things that I shouldn't be feeling. <laughs> you know? And, 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 and if I am feeling them, I, I certainly shouldn't act upon them. Uh, so uh, we just need to get away from the notion that feelings are a tool of cognition or the normative tool of cognition. They're, they're very good to pay attention to psychologically but they're not very good in terms of resolving uh, um, rational questions. And, and I'll just add, I, I think, um, to the extent that feelings are used um, uh, rather to engage an argument or to engage the person you're interacting with, when feelings are used to sort of uh, uh, cloak part of the discussion and sort of sort of right. segment off people from, well, this is a special area of knowledge I have that you right. can't enter, mm -hmm. um, then that or, is not productive. People. Well, right, and, so, and, th and that's not productive for, well, I, I would say it's not productive interrelationally, but it's right. certainly, right. It's, it's outside of what is productive for a social conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think, uh, weaponized vulnerability is a term I saw used for it, that's which true. I think is sort of useful. I like that. As you can tell, I'll go anywhere and, and talk to anyone. Um, yeah. No matter how great the, the gulf, um, and yeah. so yeah, I, I don't... Yeah, I mean, the, the stuff in, uh, uh, hopefully we can agree on this, the stuff at Evergreen College is appalling. I, I watched that, I don't know if you've seen the, the clips on it, the thinking has gone out the window, and, and the leader of it is the president of the college. It's just a mishmash of uh, insanity. There were sort of rules at medieval universities against bringing swords. <laughs> Lest a fight break out over, over an item of doctrine. Um, but that almost seems like preferable to, to not having any discussion whatsoever. Right. So, sword. Yeah. so should we, uh, we, we we'll go around and Absolutely. just kind of offer some closing reflections, but just about a, a minute, minute and a half. Yeah, uh, um, uh, so uh, I, I, I have appreciated the emphasis at the beginning and the end on um, clearly this discussion had a particular focus, but, but um, I think whenever we talk about what Christianity has to offer the poor, um, to speak only mater in a material sense is to miss the entire message of the gospel. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I just... That, that, that puts a burden on both of our sides, I think. Um, uh, it, it means um, representing the dignity of, of all parties involved. Um, and I am increasingly concerned on the left and on the right with a politics that has become detached from the person. 
um, with, with a, a politics that seeks to advance uh, an ideological view, whether it's stripping away religious freedom without concern for those who will have their religious freedom stripped, or uh, uh, proposals to uh, um, uh, affect immigration laws because of a understanding of what the nation state is that, that disregards the actual lives that will be interfered with, and with plans to, um, for instance, and I'll just drop this uh, since none of you can, can answer, uh, proposals to drastically reduce um, and cut Medicaid without any plan to fill in the service gap that will be left in its wake. Um, and I think as long as we're, uh, I am very comfortable with prudential arguments where um, proposals are, are, are made that address the consequences of the policies we're advancing. Uh, but I do think those are questions that we all have to answer. Um, that it's, it's no longer, and it was, never was sufficient to advance uh, economic principles, whether it's Keynes or, uh, uh, or whether it's Friedman, without thinking first as Christians about um, the people that will be living right. in these systems we're talking about. Thank you. So I thank you again for having me, for hearing me out. Um, and I think it was a great discussion. I really appreciate that. You know, and just closing on the question that brought the panel together, what does Christianity have to offer the poor? Well, Christianity has to offer the poor is the same thing Christianity has to offer anybody else, and that is eternal salvation, life, and the kingdom of God. Yeah. Um, and I think that to zero the question down to what we actually ended up talking about, it's what could Christians offer the poor? What do we as Christians uh, need to view as our obligations, the duties that come with our rights, as it were, you know, in society? Um, and I'm really happy to see that there's a really vibrant debate about this inside the church and inside Christian faith communities writ large. Um, and I'm really happy to have been a part of it. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I echo um, what Elizabeth just said. I think it's, um, it's important to have these conversations, so I'm honored to be part of it as well. I would say I think there's great reason to be optimistic. Um, and I think we need to be optimistic uh, because of what, of, of what we see in front of us. And I think, you know, as a Christian uh, who cares about the poor, which is, describes all of us, we have to start with Scripture. And we have to know what it tells us about the here and now and what we're supposed to do. And that we have deep responsibilities to each other and to God's creation. And I think that that coincides with the principles of property rights that are laid out in the scriptures and that you know, market systems agreed are not perfect. And I think we always have to ask ourselves, what are the alternatives? And the alternatives are demonstrably worse and they oppress and alienate um, and exploit people. So uh, you know, just kind of living at this time in human history is amazing. And I think, I mean, if you look at uh, the, the numbers, uh, poverty will, at least extreme poverty, will be a thing of the past very soon. Um, and so the question is, how do we continue to, we don't stop, we don't rest, we fight. Um, but, you know, we fight by liberating people to live into who they are and who God created them to be, not as people that need to be fixed uh, by someone else. Thank you, Anne. I, I, I think um, we've accomplished what we, we set out to do here, and that is to, to have clash and to have civility at the same time. And, uh, you know, if that's all we've accomplished, we've accomplished a great deal, especially given the, the, culture, the cultural context at the moment. Um, and, and I think, to, to go to your point, Michael, because it's, it's uh, profoundly important and it's really um, everything that the work of the Acton Institute has been based upon, and that is the dignity of the human person. All of our courses, and I, I know you're all going to just moan because you've heard this for the last two mm. days, but it's anthropology. It's who, who am I? Who, who is the human person made in the image and likeness of God? The imago Dei, the, the being, uh, C.S. Lewis, I'm fond of quoting that famous passage from C.S. Lewis, that you've never met a mere mortal that you, everyone is either an immortal splendor or an everlasting horror. 
that, we, that this is the reality and that when we touch the human person, we are touching uh, the, the grace of God that has been made. And the, the vocation that has been given to the human person is creativity and it is in our nature to be creative. And this is why I find it so sad that often the conversations are predicated on a, a paradigm of conflict. Uh, of warfare, of uh, some kind of innate hostility, whether that's between the worker and the owner of the, the means of production, or now uh, the human person and the, the creation, or men and women, that this, this taxonomy of class conflict uh, is not only a false understanding of humanity, but is also a deleterious approach to uh, questions of social policy. And I find so much more compelling, and I hope um, we've modeled a bit of this, even if our prudential applications are different. Uh, what I find so much more compelling and so much more explanatory is, is the insight, not from an economist, but from a saint. And that is, uh, we do not believe in class conflict, but in class encounter. This is St. Teresa of Calcutta, where the rich save the poor and the poor save the rich. So thank you for your participation and thank you for letting us do it. <laughs>